Hi folks, welcome to my fifth video in a series of Jordan and Israel. My name is Dave, and today we're gonna be leaving our comfy confines by the Sea of Galilee, and we're gonna head to the desert all the way down to the Dead Sea. But before we get there, we're gonna stop at the ancient city of Beit Shean with probably some of the best Roman ruins you're gonna find anywhere. Then we're gonna stop at Bethany beyond Jordan, and this is where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. And then we're gonna to head to Qumran, and this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found. And then finally, our treat at the end of the day, we get to take a dip into the Dead Sea. This is gonna be a fun day. We're going to start off with a travel tip this morning. Today is a Saturday, which in Israel is Shabbat, and literally the entire country shuts down from sunset on Friday to about an hour after sunset on Saturday to observe their national day of rest. Theoretically, in Israel, if you're checking into a hotel on a Saturday, they're not obliged to give you a room until two hours after Shabbat or three hours after sunset. So that can be quite late during the summer months. So make arrangements ahead of time. We're starting off with some cooler, wetter weather this morning as we head to our first destination, a little less than an hour away. But as the day progresses, it's gonna warm up quickly. Our first stop today is Beit Shean, which in my mind is famous for what they did to King Saul and his sons after a battle on Mount Gilboa. Now, we first saw Mount Gilboa during our visit to Megiddo while looking out over the Jezreel Valley. During that battle, King Saul's three sons were killed and Saul was mortally wounded. Saul told his armor bearer to take his sword and kill him before the Philistines find him and torture him but his armor bearer was afraid to do that. So Saul took out his own sword and fell on it. When his armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he fell on his own sword and died next to Saul. Not a good day. Oh, but it gets worse. The next day, the Philistines went out to strip the bodies of the dead and found Saul and his three sons. They stripped Saul of his armor, cut off his head and took Saul's body and his three sons to Beit Shean and pin them to the wall of the city for all to see. Now here's a cool story. The people of Jabesh Gilead were the first people saved by King Saul from the Ammonites. And you can check that out in 1 Samuel 11. And when they heard that Saul and his sons were hanging on the front gate of Beit Shean, they did a midnight commando run to remove their bodies from the wall and take them to Jabesh Gilead where they burned them and placed their bones under a tamarisk tree in town. So just remember, Good relationships today can help you even after you're dead. As we pull into Beit Shean, you can see the streets are empty as everyone is either in their homes or at the synagogue for Shabbat. Our bus driver stops so we can get a quick look at the oval-shaped Roman amphitheater. Now what's missing today is the entire seating area. But this is where Christians would have been fed to hungry lions as capital punishment for treason due to meeting in secret at night and refusing to worship images of the emperor and other state gods. It became a blood sport of entertainment for the public. The floor of the amphitheater is made of sea sand, which absorbs blood extremely well so that there'd be little delay between executions. This particular amphitheater was built around 140 AD. In reality, Beit Shean was best known as the capital city of the Decapolis during Jesus' time. What's the Decapolis, you ask? Well, it was a group of 10 cities on the eastern frontier of the Roman Empire between 1 BC and 1 AD. Nine out of 10 of those cities were on the east side of the Jordan River, with Beit Shean being the only one of the cities on the west side of the Jordan. During Jesus' time, it was known as Scatopolis, or City of the Skits. From Beit Shean, the only flat route to the Mediterranean Sea is through the Jezreel Valley. This was the interstate route to the entire kingdom of Egypt, which is why Beit Shean was the gatekeeper of the whole country. It was a big time city. We just saw a quick glimpse of this 3D map, but take a minute to check out this great example of what every Roman city looked like at Jesus' time. The main focus was to create the unity of the Roman Empire and to express unity of the empire. It has north-south streets, a market area, bathhouses, a theater, an amphitheater for sport and executions, a hippodrome for chariot racing, and incredible architecture. It's a great place to live. 
as long as you fall in line. These are the entranceways into the theater and you can probably guess from the years of deterioration that there's not much of the theater left behind. But you would be wrong. This theater was excavated in the 1970s and it is gorgeous. Believe it or not, only one third of the original seating exists today. This would have been used for theater shows and light entertainment and also for political gatherings. One of the cool things they're doing here is rebuilding and recreating what this city used to look like. For example, as the archeologists rebuild this theater, they color the new columns a different color so you can distinguish what was old and what is new while giving you the overall visual of what it used to look like. If you're fortunate enough to make several trips here, you'll be able to see more and more of what this ancient city looked like each time you visit. This theater once held 7,000 seats made from limestone. There's a row of rectangular columns around the outside of the structure that suggest an upper section of seating existed as well. It would have been pretty spectacular. The stage area would have been enclosed and covered with fabric, while the semicircular orchestra area was paved with marble, as was the main raised stage. In the background, you'll notice there's a tell. As we've described before, a tell is an ancient civilization that has been covered up by Mother Nature. This tell is actually the ancient city of Scotopolis. As more people came into this region, the town had to spread out down below. At the top of the tell, there is a temple of Zeus overlooking the city, and this theater was positioned just right for everyone to see it. Well, let's talk about public bathhouses. Public bathhouses were how people cleaned up. The process included covering their bodies with olive oil and then scraping it off. If you had a few extra coins in your pocket, you could pay someone to do that for you. Public bathhouses were great places for socializing. This bathhouse is 100 meters long and 90 meters wide, and it was constructed in the fourth century. It had eight halls with an open pool and fountains to greet you as you entered, as well as two public bathrooms and a large sauna right in the center. So far, three bathhouses have been discovered at Beit Shein. The sauna would have been my favorite place, and to heat the water, slaves would start a fire in the early morning and use big bellows to move hot air under the floor of the sauna. This process is called hypocost. The sauna would open up your pores, and then it would be time to scrape off the olive oil. The final step would be to add perfume, and you'd be smelling fine. We can't talk about public bathhouses without talking about public toilets, right? Well, this restroom would have been all covered in marble with running water under your feet. So I'm guessing you'd put one cheek on this side and the other cheek on the other side and you'd be good to go. And best of all, you're given a soft leaf at the end of a twig or stick for toilet paper. Oh, great. Honey, we're out of toilet paper! Here you go. Oh, and when I was at the store the other day, they had a new brand. Evergreen. One of the things you'll notice here is that there are several different kinds and layers of flooring wherever you set foot. The Romans used a lot of detailed mosaics on their floors, but during the Byzantine times, Instead of spending time and effort on repairing the mosaics, they simply removed marble slates off the walls and made them into new flooring. There are several main streets still in existence in Beit Shein, and the one we're on right now is called Palladia Street, which was a north-south street on the west side of the city. Some pretty cool city and traffic planning took place here. You can see the black basalt paving stones are located diagonally so the wheels from carts won't get stuck in the cracks. And the street is curved so the water can quickly disperse into the drains located on either side of the street. Underneath this street is a huge drainage system. I mean, it's big enough to drive a modern day vehicle through. On the 
west side of the street is where the luxury shops were located, and this shopping area actually had two levels. H.E.N. was well known for the quality linens. You could also purchase silk from China, pepper from India, gold from Africa, diamonds, perfumes, spices. Remember, Beijing was the gateway to the Mediterranean Sea, and they had access to just about everything. Crossing Palladius Street to the east, we're looking at the main square or agora, meaning the heart of the city, where people met, shopped, read the daily news, etc. This is where everyone hung out, and it was beautiful. Mosaic floors, beautiful columns, and incredible fountains, including a 175-foot tall water fountain to the north near the base of the tell. Part of the philosophy of these Roman cities was to build amazing features and incredible venues to show the power and might of the Roman Empire, and conversely, to squelch any thoughts of rebellion. As I said before, this was a great place to live as long as you were subservient to the state. So why all of the damage? In a word, earthquakes. Many buildings were damaged during the earthquake of 363 AD, then destroyed by an earthquake in 749 AD. Israel experiences a major earthquake every 85 years, and the last one took place in 1929. So if I calculate that out, uh, maybe we should get out of here. But before we do, we're gonna warm up with a couple of cappuccinos. Why don't you take a look around and see some of the other sites? streets of Beit Shean, we are heading back to the Jordan River, but this time we're going to visit the location where Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. If you missed the previous video where we were baptized in the Jordan River at a different location, look for a link to the Sea of Galilee video at the end of this video. Jesus' baptismal site is called Bethany Beyond Jordan, and it's a couple hour drive from Beit Shean, but as you can see, we're getting close to the Dead Sea. Just a little further down the road, we come across another tell outside our bus window. This tell is called Mehola, and it's the hometown of the prophet Elisha. In fact, this is where Elisha met the prophet Elijah. That's a story in 1 Kings 19 where Elisha is plowing a field with his oxen, and Elijah walks up to him, throws his cloak around Elisha's shoulder, thereby adopting him and initiating his prophetic future. Speaking of Elijah, we talked about him in an earlier video at Mount Carmel, but the location where Jesus was baptized is also well known for several other events, including where Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire. As the story goes, Elijah and Elisha approached the Jordan River where Elijah took off his cloak, rolled it up and struck the water and the water divided just as it did for Moses at the Red Sea so they could walk across. Minutes later, Elijah was taken up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had dropped to the ground, and when Elisha got back to the Jordan River, he struck it with Elijah's cloak, and again, it parted and Elisha crossed back over to what we call today the Israeli side of the Jordan River. So not only did Jesus get baptized right here, and Elijah was taken up to heaven in a chariot of fire right here, but this is also the place where the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River after they entered the Promised Land. It just so happens that the Kelt River feeds into the Jordan River at this point, and it also just so happens that God is a pretty good geologist. The Kelt River starts just north of Jerusalem, comes through Jericho, and joins the Jordan River at this location. This river brought lots of stones from the mountains into the water and actually paved the Jordan River. This was a great place to cross the river because anything with wheels would have gotten stuck anywhere else. 
So maybe it didn't just so happen to be the exact right place at the exact right time. Maybe it was God's perfect plan all along. Ready for another cool story that took place right here? This is where Elisha performed the miracle of the floating ax head. The story is in 2 Kings chapter 6. Now, iron was extremely valuable in those days, and a group Elisha was with crossed the Jordan River to cut down some trees so they could build houses. An iron ax head fell into the river, and Elisha threw a piece of wood into the river at that same spot, and the ax head floated to the top. Boom. The landscape is beginning to change as we enter the West Bank area. There's currently about a half a million people in the West Bank settling in after the Six Day War in the 70s. We arrive at Bethany Beyond Jordan, better known as the place Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. We just talked about Elijah being swept up to heaven in a flaming chariot. But the same Greek word used to describe that cosmic event is the same Greek word used to describe the sky opening up as Jesus was being baptized. This too was a cosmic event as God audibly spoke, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. It doesn't look very formidable now, but when the children of Israel crossed the Jordan River, it was at least two thirds of a mile wide. There's actually mountain ranges on both sides that were carved out by the river. For me, just being able to sit down and take in all that has happened at this location makes it a pretty spectacular sight. We're just 15 minutes away from our next stop at Qumran, but enough time to talk about Jericho, a biblical city just to the west of us. The date palm trees are blocking our view of Jericho out our bus window, but if you look close at those hills, you can see caves, as in where the spies of Rahab hid for three days. You can find that story in Joshua chapter two. Now, very interestingly, this same hill is the traditional Mount of Temptation where Satan tempted Jesus after he fasted for 40 days. The story in Matthew chapter two says that the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness and this area is known as the wilderness of Jericho. This is also the place where King Zedekiah met his doom. In 586 BC, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon destroyed Jerusalem and burned down the first temple. King Zedekiah escaped Jerusalem through underground tunnels, but Nebuchadnezzar's soldiers caught up to him here in the wilderness of Jericho. They brought King Zedekiah before King Nebuchadnezzar who killed his sons in front of him and then gouged out his eyes and carried him in a cage all the way to Babylonia. Brutal. King Zedekiah was the last king of Judah and his sons were at the end of the line of David. And we all know that the Messiah was to come from the line of David. So now what? Well, Isaiah prophesied about 150 years beforehand in Isaiah 11.1, 1, a shoot will come up from the line of Jesse. From his roots, a branch will bear fruit. Jesse was King David's father. That shoot is Jesus. Here's some cool facts about Jericho. It's the first city the children of Israel conquered as they entered the Promised Land. And it's the lowest elevation city in the world at 846 feet below sea level. And it's where a wee little man named Zacchaeus climbed up in a sycamore tree to see Jesus over a crowd. Before we get started on our tour here at Qumran, we need to fuel up with more chicken shawarma. It never gets old. Qumran was an ancient city that belonged to the tribe of Judah, and that's mentioned in Joshua 10. And it was one of the six salt production cities that belonged to the tribe of Judah. What's interesting and dangerous here is that rain falls in this area only one to five times a year. And when that happens, waterfalls and rivers descend from the mountaintops. Flash floods have occurred here that have swept people into the Dead Sea. The people who lived here collected those flash floodwaters into aqueducts, which filled each of the cisterns that had been set up. 
which proves survival is the best motivator for innovation. The Dead Sea Scrolls were found just before November 29, 1947, the date the UN decided to divide the land between the Jews and the Arabs. A Bedouin boy who was searching for a lost goat discovered the ancient Hebrew scrolls. A professor from Jerusalem was contacted and asked to come take a look at the discovery and just as he was beginning to read the scrolls, the power was cut as the War of Independence started. He was only able to read one line. For the next 23 years, the Jews were never allowed to see the scrolls until after the Six-Day War in the 1970s, except for seven scrolls purchased by the Hebrew University. They were kept by Catholic monks in a monastery in the old city of Jerusalem. You've no doubt noticed how small some of the pieces of the scrolls are that were collected. This is not how they were found. In fact, the authors of these scrolls covered them with fabric and put them inside a sealed pottery vessel and placed them into a dry desert climate and sealed the cave. For 2,000 years, there was zero damage. You're probably thinking, ah, once they got exposed to the air, they started falling apart. Nope. See, during the excavation between 1947 and 1956, the Jordanian and British archaeologists paid by the piece. So the Bedouins who had the scrolls ripped them into pieces and collected a whole lot more money than had they just handed over a complete scroll. In total, 900 scrolls have been discovered, but only 20 were in complete condition. The others, just bits and pieces. But what the Dead Sea Scrolls are is a complete library of the Jewish people from the Old Testament time, including arguments of different Jewish groups. There were 12 caves in all that were found to contain the Dead Sea Scrolls. The oldest biblical scrolls ever discovered, Exodus, Samuel, and Jeremiah from 250 BC, were discovered in Cave 4. Cave 5 was destroyed by an avalanche about two decades ago. 118 Old Testament biblical scrolls were found there. Now think about that. They were protected for over 2,000 years before being discovered, and then the cave was destroyed. Do you think God had his hand on protecting those scrolls until just the right time? Before these scrolls were found, the previous Bible was 1,000 years younger. So those scrolls filled a 1,000 year gap. Now we have proof that today's book of Isaiah, for example, is exactly the same as what Jesus had. The story most folks have heard is that a sect of monk-like Jews wrote and preserved the Dead Sea Scrolls here at Qumran. The only problem is there's no evidence that any Jews have ever lived like monks. Now from the knowledge we have today, they are most likely written by temple priests during the reign of King Antiochus. Antiochus, better known as the Madman by his people, wanted to make a new Greek calendar in 167 BC that his entire empire would follow, which included his birthday being celebrated on the 25th of every month. Antiochus approached the priest and told him to change their calendar to his calendar. The priest responded by saying they couldn't change the biblical calendar, so Antiochus gave them the my way or the highway speech. The priest escaped, taking their scroll library from the temple with them and hid them in the desert here in Qumran. As I've said in another video, there's pros and cons to any tour. On one hand, you can see and experience a ton of really cool things. And on the other hand, you can't spend a lot of time at any one place. And this is one of those places you wish you could spend a full day at. to our final destination, Herod's Dead Sea Hotel at the south end of the Dead Sea. Because of massive evaporation over the years, there's now a northern Dead Sea and a southern Dead Sea with a total of seven beaches to choose from. The southernmost beach is called the Segregated Beach, which has separate men's and women's beaches per traditional Jewish values. The north part of the Dead Sea is a bit murky and the beaches will charge an admission fee of around $20 to $30, but 
you do get to experience waves and the world famous Dead Sea Mud. The North Beaches also have resort features which would be great for family vacations. The south part of the Dead Sea has the Caribbean blue-green water and because it's shallower than the north part, the water is very calm. The beaches are free, but there's no mud, only salt. Lots of salt. So much so that the sand you think you're walking on is salt. Since the north part of the Dead Sea is fed by the freshwater Jordan River, the south beaches have a much higher salt content. The Dead Sea loses three feet of water each year due to lack of water from the Jordan River and evaporation. Up until just a little over a hundred years ago, the water level of the Dead Sea was as high as our bus's rooftop. However, it is 1300 feet deep, so it won't disappear anytime soon but it will continue to get smaller. Today, two beaches in the north have been closed permanently due to sinkholes which are caused by the Dead Sea evaporating away and pulling water out of the ground. My hope is that the Sea of Galilee up north where we left this morning can remain at optimum levels and allow the Jordan River to continue replenishing the Dead Sea for years to come. The Dead Sea salt comes from the rocks in the hills Rain washes the rocks and the minerals go to the sea. A normal ocean or sea has about a 2.8 to 4% salt content, but because the Dead Sea is a dead end and it keeps evaporating away, the water gets saltier each year. Maximum salt content that water can hold is 34% and the Dead Sea is at 33.7%. Anything over 34% and the salt drops to the bottom of the sea. In addition to evaporation, salt and mineral factories contribute greatly to the Dead Sea's water reduction. It's thought that up to 50% of the reduction is caused by these factories. Phosphate is the number one mineral produced from the Dead Sea today. Believe it or not, asphalt or tar was the main Dead Sea industry in the Old Testament times. It would float up from the bottom of the sea and float to the surface. If you ever wondered what Noah used on the outside of the ark to keep the water from coming in, it was asphalt from the Dead Sea. Asphalt is also a main ingredient needed for mummification. In the New Testament Jesus time, the main industry here switched to balsam perfume. The balsam tree was the treasure of the kingdom of Judea and it was the most expensive perfume in ancient times as well as an important medicine known as persimmon. There were only three places in the entire world where you could grow this balsam tree. And it was just a tiny area between the city of Jericho and En Gedi. When the Queen of Sheba visited King Solomon, she brought these spice trees with her. The scholars tell us that King Solomon invented a distillation process to turn the sap of the balsam trees into perfume. And why was it so expensive? Well, get ready. It was the strongest aphrodisiac of all time. Tourism is one of the top industries in this area today and we are more than happy to support their efforts. Although it's been nearly 20 years with no new hotels built in this area, four hotels were approved earlier this year to provide formal offers that would provide a thousand new rooms, conference centers and shopping centers in the South Dead Sea area. After a long, hard day of travel and experiencing incredible sights, we have only one thing on our minds. It's time to float in the Dead Sea. So how to explain this? Well, you just sit back like you're easing into your favorite chair and the salt water does the rest. You are so buoyant that it is extremely difficult to try and stand vertically and tread water like you would in a normal pool. They warn you not to try to flip over on your stomach, so of course I had to try, and yep, not a good idea. Your body wants to force your head underwater and you do not even want to take a tiny sip of that salt water. Wow! Several beaches have lifeguards with supplies of milk in case that happens. It is actually extremely dangerous. Like I said before, the South Dead Sea doesn't have the famous mud, 
but the water coats your skin with what feels like baby oil. Not greasy, just a very smooth feeling. Personally, I've never felt more beautiful. One of the cool things about our hotel is that they pump the dead sea water into an indoor heated swimming pool, so you can enjoy the experience no matter what time of year it is. And there's nothing quite like floating in a pool with strangers, especially when no one has control over their own body. When you get back to your room, you get a chance to view what is one of the most spectacular sights anywhere. This was the playground of Herod and many of the elites of biblical times, and we'll get to explore some of that in our next video. Well, that wraps it up for this video. We hope you had as much fun watching it as we did making it. And if you liked it, give me a thumbs up down below, leave a comment and subscribe to my channel. Next time, we're gonna visit the En Gedi Nature Reserve, a beautiful spot where David hid from Saul in the caves in the hills. And then we head off to Masada, which was Herod's incredible fortified city that he built on the top of a plateau on the edge of a cliff. It's amazing. So we'll see you there. Thanks for watching. Bye. As we pull into Beit Shien, you can see that the streets are empty as everyone is either in the amphitheater. <laughs> no, they're not at the amphitheater, they're in their homes. Settling in after the Six Day War in the 70s. <laughs> Elisha then picked up Elijah's cloak that had dropped to the ground and when Elijah, Elisha, Elijah, Elisha, the arguments of different Jewish groups. Are you done? I don't want to scream this direction. You I want scream to scream both ways because then it could be you. You can go, ah, ah, you can look at you from different <laughs> angles. All right, let's try that. Here you go. 